living on the edge of the law in Sydney at the height of Sydney's era as probably the most corrupt city in the English-speaking world since Prohibition, Chicago. Neville ran went from being a street smart guy that worked for a bookmaker to being a street smart barrister that worked for the trade unions to being a street smart politician who climbed his way up the greasy pole to being the Premier. I'm Andrew Rule. This is Life and Crimes. Today, I'm going to sit down and start writing a long, strong story about Neville Rand, who died some years ago. Neville Rand, of course, is a former Premier of New South Wales. He was and is a Labor hero. He was a very astute politician and a very successful politician. One of the most successful in Australia's history because at one time in New South Wales, when he was Premier, he led his party to a record majority. I think he had something like 66 seats out of 99, some ridiculous majority like that. And so Neville Rand has become one of the all-time greats of the Australian Labor Party. But Neville Rand was a very complex man. And when he died in 2014, I was one of those who wrote a very tough obituary on Neville Rand, albeit from the distance dividing Sydney and Melbourne. And that was because over the years, I have been able to gather information from various people in Sydney and elsewhere who had a lot to do with the sort of criminal element who ran Sydney back in the bad old days. And by that I mean from the 1950s right through to about the turn of the century, but specifically mostly 60s, 70s and 80s. And that era of gross corruption was probably worst under the long-running Liberal Premier Sir Robert Askin in the 60s, and early 70s, and then after a couple of hiccups and a couple of very short-lived premiers under Neville Rand in his 10 years between 1976 and 1986. And although it's widely held that Sir Robert Askin was a crook, because Sir Robert Askin was regarded as someone who started out in politics as a poor man and ended up leaving a very large fortune when he died and that he had accumulated this fortune through corruption and skullduggery. For some reason, a lot of people don't apply the same test to Neville Rand. And this is most peculiar, because Neville Rand was famously, as he said himself, the boy from Belmain. He was the youngest of eight children of a battling working-class couple. He was bright, clever, uh, good-looking, articulate. He was everything that was good when it comes to to making good in the world, and, and indeed he did. He ended up getting to university where he studied law in the 1940s, and he later became a lawyer and a barrister, and subsequently, of course, a very successful politician. But none of those occupations of themselves should make you a multi-millionaire. Okay, you're a successful barrister for a decade, as he was before he went to Parliament. He was a QC for eight years. Before that, he was quite a well-known barrister. But Neville Wren largely represented trade unions and things like that. He generally was working as a barrister for the little people against the big people. He wasn't really in a position to be making huge money from what was just a prosperous law practice. A successful barrister in Sydney in that era, would be expected to make enough money to have, you know, a good house, a good holiday house, a good car, and good holidays overseas, and if he or she had children, to be able to pay the school fees for the children. What you don't expect is that such a person, coming from a working class background with no inherited wealth, would end up accumulating an estate that ran into something like $40 million because those are big figures and it's interesting to wonder how an honest politician would accumulate such a vast fortune. But it would appear that Neville Wren did and that those people who don't drink the Kool-Aid and don't 
believe in the myth and the legend of the great and the good Neville Wren, believe that he was, in fact, an extremely sophisticated corrupt politician, that he made his predecessor, Sir Robert Askin, look basic and primitive because he was much better at it and he was much better at getting away with it and he set things up so that he would not actually be caught with his fingers in the till. Now, I realise that these are just general assertions and that there's no reason for anyone to take notice of general assertions without some form of detail and some form of evidence, some form of fluent linking together of stories that reinforce our main theme. Well, let's start with this. One of my sources for many years about crime in Sydney, about corruption in Sydney, and particularly about racing skullduggery and gambling skullduggery in Sydney, is a man called David Waterhouse and another man called Arthur Harris. Now, David Waterhouse is a son of the late Bill Waterhouse, who was a Leviathan bookmaker, possibly at one time the biggest bookmaker in the world or very close to it. He certainly said he was or thought he was. David was his younger son, the third of his three children. His brother, uh, someone we won't talk about today, is Robbie Waterhouse, who, of course, along with his father Bill, was disgraced because he and Bill were warned off for something like 17 years after being implicated in the fine cotton ringing scandal, which happened in Queensland, but which was clearly associated with people in Sydney and, I would argue, very closely associated with the Waterhouses, which is why they were banned and warned off. OK, let's talk about David Waterhouse. He's the younger brother of Robbie. He's the youngest son of Bill. David Waterhouse grew up in that family, going to the races, working with his father and his brother, and sometimes with his sister, Louise, and sometimes his uncle, Jack, and his cousin, John, and others, his other cousin, Martin, for that matter. And the Waterhouses, jointly and severally, and sometimes individually, were very, very large bookmakers based in Sydney. And they handled hundreds of thousands of dollars at every race meeting, every weekend. They fielded on the gallops, the trots, the dogs, and anything that was going. And in fact, like a lot of other people, they would take SP bets, starting price bets, which meant they would take bets that weren't taxed. They would take bets that weren't recorded anywhere and that were technically illegal and they wouldn't pay tax on it, which meant that they weren't Robinson Crusoe in that regard because most bookies in those days used to do that, whether they will admit it or not. What I'm saying here is that David Waterhouse grew up in that milieu. He grew up, even as a teenager, are taking bets over the phone. He has told me a fascinating story of being 15 or 16 years old, being brought home by his father from a skiing weekend and told, listen, I want you to man the phone all day today because Mr Packer's going to ring up and have bets. And indeed, David took SP bets, starting price bets, from Kerry Packer all one Saturday and was so pleased with himself because at the end of the Saturday... He had won so much from Packer, theoretically, that Packer owed the family $1 million. He owed him $1 million. Every favourite had gone down. Kerry Packer had backed every favourite that had gone down. And so Packer owed the Waterhouses $1 million back in the 1970s. This was a fantastic sum. When Bill Waterhouse got home, David Waterhouse, the young, keen teenager, said, Dad, Dad, great news. Kerry Packer owes us a million dollars and his father abused him. I can't repeat what he said to him, but it was full of uh, very nasty words. And David almost burst into tears. He was absolutely distraught. He thought he'd done a great thing. And he said, but Dad, he owes us. We don't owe him. We've won. We've won. And Bill said, you idiot. He said, he'll never pay. You've let him lose too much. And that's exactly what happened. Kerry Packer didn't pay. And this is just one of the stories that David Waterhouse tells about life in a bookmaking family living on the edge of the law in Sydney at the height of 
Sydney's era as probably the most corrupt city in the English-speaking world since Prohibition Chicago. The interesting thing about David Waterhouse, and I first met him in the mid-1990s when he was estranged from the rest of his family, from his father and his brother and his sister. And one of the things that was happening is that Bill, his father, and Robbie, his brother, were trying to get back into racing. They were trying to get their bookmakers' licences back and be allowed back at the track. Now, why they thought they should be allowed back at the track when other people who are outed for life stay out for life is another thing. But interestingly, eventually, they were allowed back. But in the process, they had to give evidence at an Australian jockey club hearing into whether they should get back or not. And David Waterhouse gave evidence at this tribunal, and he gave evidence actually against his father and his brother. And I was there, and I was enormously impressed with the detail with which he could give evidence. He could say on such and such a day, they met at such and such a place and there were 12 chairs around the table and the weather was sunny. He would give all these details, which you could verify by looking up the newspaper of the day or photographs or whatever. And he clearly had a photographic memory, which made him a very dangerous witness and a very good witness. And I introduced myself to him afterwards and he had become isolated from his family. He was a young married. He didn't have any children at the time. And another witness called Arthur Harris mentioned earlier who had been an employee of the Waterhouses. They were very friendly and very interested in meeting a reporter from Melbourne who really had no prior connections with the Waterhouse family and had no particular prejudices one way or the other. And so it was that I became quite friendly with David and his wife and Arthur Harris, and that between them all, they became very good sources of stories and background over many years. And I say all that in order to bolster what I'm about to say. David Waterhouse has told me that Neville Rand was as close a friend as his father, Bill Waterhouse, had. Now, he says that Bill, although he was enormously well-known and uh, quite famous, that Bill didn't really have many close friends because deep down, Bill was a deeply unpleasant man and to some extent a sociopath. But he said if he did have a friend in the world, it was Neville Rand. And when you ask him why this was so, he will say, well, my father, Bill, went to Sydney University in the 1940s during the war, during World War II. And he was a young man then, and he was at an age where he could have been conscripted to go into the armed forces. But Bill knew that if you transferred from law, which he started to do, into medicine, that he would not be conscripted because medical students were exempt. And so Bill, very cunningly and typically and selfishly, while other young men were going off to fight for Australia, to defend Australia against the Japanese or to go to Europe to fight the Nazis, Bill thought it would be better to enrol in a bodgy medical course and steer clear of it. He also bought land up the country so that he could qualify for exemption on the basis of being a primary producer. So he uh, left nothing to chance. And at the end of the war, in 1945, when it was clear that the Allies had won, Bill decided he didn't like medicine anymore and he switched back to doing law. And this meant that Bill was doing first or second year law at the same time as students who were four years younger than him. And these students included a whole raft of interesting people who would go on to become quite significant figures in New South Wales legal affairs and New South Wales politics and New South Wales business and New South Wales racing. And Bill was the king of the kids. He knew them, and one of them was Neville Rand. We won't name all the others because there are at least two or three judges among them and other legal figures who have been very useful to the Waterhouse clan over the journey. But we're not in the business of defaming judges. Neville Rand was 
so close to Bill at the time that when Bill started bookmaking, Bill didn't actually practice law or barely practice law. He went bookmaking because it was sort of a family thing. There were bookies in the family. And he took it on and bookmaking in the 1940s and 50s was a very lucrative game in Australia because the country was full of return servicemen who loved nothing better than to be on the piss and on the punt. And there was so much cash on the racetracks in the 40s and 50s that Bill just made money hand over fist. He was good at it. He was a very astute bookmaker. And Neville ran as a student and then as a struggling young lawyer, would come and work for Bill, his mate, his great friend, as a runner or a penciler, that sort of thing, at the races. He would go and put bets on for Bill. He would handle cash for Bill. He would do all that sort of stuff in the betting ring at uh, Randwick and uh, Rose Hill and, and Warwick Farm and so on, and at the Dogs and the Trots and everywhere else. And, of course... It would be at those places that Neville ran. The battling boy from Belmain would rub shoulders with all sorts of people, many of them colourful people, many of them racing identities, by which we mean crooks who were race fixers, who were scammers, who were gangsters, people who were drug dealers and pimps and so on and so on. He would be rubbing shoulders with those people, putting bets on for them, running favours for them, running errands. And so... You can see that Neville Rand, on the evidence of the people that knew him best, was very well educated in the ways of corruption and black money because he was hanging around with bookies who all used to be mixed up in SP bookmaking, that is starting price bookmaking, which was illegal, and also at some level mixed up in illegal gambling of other sorts. And the waterhouses were long-time scammers, black marketeers, and anything that was illegal. In fact, their pedigree went right back through Sydney history to smuggling contraband into Sydney off boats. Their forebears had done that. They were black marketeers during the war. Bill and his brother were, in fact, arrested during the war for selling black market materials and uh, sly grog and all the rest of it. And Neville Rand was in very tight with a family and with their friends who were engaged at all times in questionable and criminal behaviour. Okay, Neville Rand is no deal. He's a good young lawyer. He's a good young lawyer who, by and large, worked for the small end of town for unions and working people against the big end of town. Neville Rand did not go off and work for big tobacco or, you know, big automotive or whatever it might be, he worked for the unions and that was good because he was able to represent, you know, people who needed help and he would be reasonably well remunerated, reasonably well paid for doing that, but not stratospherically. You know, you could be a successful lawyer and win a lot of cases, but it's not going to make you into a millionaire working for battlers and for unions. It should not make you into a millionaire, if you're honest. And the reality is that as a barrister, albeit a pretty good one, Neville Rann, in the late 50s and early 60s, would not have been making a fortune. He just would have been supporting the lifestyle that he'd come to like, and that is running around to clubs, nightclubs and so on. He loved showgirls. His first wife was Marsha, Marsha Rann, who was a dancer at the Tivoli Theatre, nightclub, whatever. And so he ran in those circles. He was the sort of guy that got around the club scene. He's the sort of guy that went to King's Cross and those sort of places. And he was a good-looking young rooster. And he was very fond of showgirls, uh, not only in Sydney, but around the world. There are stories of him in uh, Paris and other places. And he married his first wife, Marsha who was also very young. I think they were both about 20. And she already had one young child when they married. And that little boy was adopted, legally adopted by Ran. They later had a daughter together whose name was Kim. And Kim would grow up to become 
very friendly with the Waterhouse family because her father knew the Waterhouse family. And indeed, David Waterhouse, as a young man, went out for six months with Kim, Ran. And so he was very familiar with the entire Ran family. And we'll be back after this. The point I'm getting to in my own long-winded way is this, that in 1976, when Neville Rand was already a Member of Parliament in the New South Wales Parliament, Neville Rand was running to lead the Labor Party at the election of 76. And one day, not long before the election, Rand comes around to the Waterhouse's office at 158 Pacific Highway in North Sydney, which is just on the other side of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. And he was a familiar figure. He was often at the office and he was often at the Waterhouse's private home. He was Bill's probably best mate. And they did favours for one another. And clearly he was a rising man by this. He was a member of parliament. He was a QC. He'd been a QC for, by this stage, maybe nine years. And he told Bill he'd come around to get some money. He didn't just want a hundred bucks because he was caught short. He wanted $5,000 cash. Now, $5,000 cash in 1976 was quite a sum of money. And I know this because it's around the time when I started work. And my total earnings for the year of 1975 were $3,000. Adults working in those days might earn $100 a week, which is $5,000 a year. And that is the sort of money that Neville ran asked his friend Bill to get. And Bill went up to the safe upstairs and he opened the safe where they kept the cash when they brought it home from the races. And he pulled out 10 $500 bundles. And David knew that they were there because his job was to count the money. And he would count the money at every race day, put the rubber bands around it and they'd put it away in the safe. And he said Bill would keep tens of thousands of dollars there. And he just hooked out $5,000 a year's salary for a battler, and he gave it to Neville Rand. No one's sure why Neville Rand wanted the money, and in a sense, it doesn't matter. But it's interesting that he needed or wanted cash. It's interesting that there was no paperwork attached. It's interesting, and this is the most interesting thing, is that he was on such close terms with Bill Waterhouse that he had the sort of relationship with a man that we know to be a crooked bookmaker at the very least and a race fixer and a thoroughly bad actor that Neville Rand could ask him for money at any time and get it. That relationship is one of the reasons that we can point the finger at Neville Rand in retrospect because there is no doubt, looking back on it, that Bill Waterhouse was connected with the three worst scandals in Australian racing history. Those three scandals, and we've mentioned them before on the podcast, were the nobbling of Big Flu in the 1969 Melbourne Cup, when the hot favourite Big Flu was nobbled with a very severe drug so that he started to scour, that is, he got terrible diarrhoea shortly before the cup starting time and had to be scratched from the race, I think, about half an hour before the race. There is no doubt that Bill Waterhouse was behind that because the strapper who did the nobbling on his deathbed many years later admitted that a bookmaker had got him to do it. And contemporaneous telephone records, which the police had been able to obtain, showed that that strapper, a crook called Les Lewis, had telephoned with trunk calls the Waterhouse office in Sydney. He'd called them from Melbourne and he'd talked to them at a time when the lowly strappers weren't making trunk calls to anywhere. He also flew to Sydney, which was interesting, and went to meet Waterhouse at Waterhouse's office at 158 Pacific Highway. This, you would think, is fairly good circumstantial evidence that Les Lewis nobbled Big Flu on behalf of Bill Waterhouse, and indeed the late, great Bart Cummings, the trainer of Big Flu, always believed 
that Bill Waterhouse did it. And we know this because some years later, Bart deliberately lured Bill Waterhouse into accepting a large amount of bets on a horse of his, the great Lilani, by telling Bill, as an allegedly friendly tip, that she could not win. And the truth was the opposite. She could and did win. And so Bill fell in, took a mountain of money on Lilani and lost it. Bill was furious about that. He went to Bart Cummings and said, why did you do that? And Bart said, for Big Falou. The other two scandals that Bill Waterhouse was involved in, up to his elbows in, were both in 1984. One of them was the murder of a small Sydney trainer called George Brown, who was murdered shortly after he refused to ring in a horse in Brisbane. He was a Sydney trainer, small timer, refused to ring in a horse, which the gangsters, the bad guys, had told him to ring in. And shortly afterwards, he was murdered. He had his legs and arms broken. His body was burnt in his car. It was a shocking crime. There's never been a worse crime associated with racing in Australia than that. It was the sort of thing that you hear about happening in South America. There is no doubt that Bill Waterhouse and others known to him were connected with the George Brown case. And the third thing is the notorious fine cotton scandal, which happened later in 1984. Again, the Waterhouse family were implicated. We know this because A, David has told us that is the case. B, Arthur Harris, who used to work for the Waterhouses, has told us that. And C, the authorities at the time decided the evidence was so strong that they banned both Bill and Robbie Waterhouse for many years. In fact, for life. But they got back on after 17 years. I'll be pulling together a lot of different things in demolishing the legend of Neville Rand because I think all we owe to the dead is the truth. And here's another truth that it's very difficult for Ran apologists and Ran fans to account for, and that is this. In 1979, there was the terrible Lunar Park fire in Sydney in which six children and the father of two of the children were burned to death. There's no reasonable doubt that the fire wasn't arson. It had to be arson, really. It was not an electrical fire. But Sydney was so corrupt at the time that the people who almost certainly set this up for their own ends because they wanted to wreck Lunar Park in order to demolish Lunar Park in order that they could then get hold of the long-term leasehold and build tall buildings on the land, those people organised for bent police to take over the investigation. One of them, an Inspector Knight, immediately claimed that it was an electrical fault that started the fire. This was complete crap. It wasn't. It never could have been. And even if it had been, he could not possibly have known that in the first 12 hours. But he claimed it anyway. It's interesting to note that a coroner later said that wasn't the case. It was never an electrical fault. The connection between Knight, the man who clearly was running interference for someone in order to stop the media making accusations of arson, is that up above this Inspector Knight was a senior policeman called Bill Allen. Now, Bill Allen was a notoriously corrupt copper. Bill Allen, and again, we can get this from anywhere, but let's get it from David Waterhouse because he's an actual personal eyewitness to all these events. Bill Allen was so bent that David Waterhouse remembers that when his family, when his father ran an illegal casino in Rockwell Crescent near King's Cross, that David would sometimes pick up the bribe money and pass it along. David actually knew that bribe money was paid to Bill Allen and that bribe money went back up the chain to other senior police and also to politicians. And clearly, David says, it was going in part to Ran. He said effectively, Ran and Bill Allen 
became silent partners in the Waterhouse's illegal casino. In 1981, the plot thickens again because Bill Allen, somehow or other, despite his reputation, now he's known as a bent cop, every journalist in every pub, every other copper, every taxi driver, they could all tell you that Bill Allen was as bent as a $3 note. And yet this man is promoted, plucked from his job as, you know, as some sort of senior policeman. He might have been a superintendent, whatever. He is promoted above 16 more senior police to become a deputy commissioner. Now, this was done by the Premier and Police Minister, Neville Rann. Here's the amazing thing. Neville Rann, when he took over as Premier in 19... 19- 76, he insisted on being police minister as well. And he insisted, even later when he handed over that ministry to someone else, on keeping his fingers on the pulse of the police ministry. And Bill Waterhouse, his great and good friend, said at the time in private, of course he wants to be police minister, because to be police minister is to be the Minister for Corruption. Bill was making a joke, but he wasn't joking. It was the truth. He thought it was amusing, but it was actually the truth. To be police minister in Sydney in the 70s and the 80s was to be the Minister for Corruption. And how do we know this? Well, one of the interesting facts is that the clearly corrupt Sir Robert Askin, the hugely corrupt Liberal Premier of the 1960s and early 70s, he also had insisted on being the police minister. Isn't that funny? Now, why would Neville Rand do this? Well, you can take the view that Neville Rand was so naive and so stupid that somehow Bill Allen pulled the wool over his eyes. Well, maybe you could run that argument for somebody like Bjorki Peterson in Queensland and say, well, he was a a yokel, a God-fearing peanut farmer from the backwoods who was easily fooled by the likes of the bent police in the big bad city. You could perhaps make that argument for someone like Joe Bjorki-Peterson. Maybe. You could not make that argument for someone like Neville Rann. Neville Rann came from inner Sydney. Neville Rann was street smart. Neville Rann went from being a street smart guy that worked for a bookmaker to being a street smart barrister that worked for the trade unions to being a street smart politician who climbed his way up the greasy pole to being the Premier by being sharper, faster, more adroit, more savvy than all the others. And so if Neville Rand made Bill Allen Deputy Commissioner, you can bet he did it, knowing exactly who Bill Allen was and exactly why he was doing it. And I'm here to say, and again, this is on the advice of David Waterhouse and Arthur Harris and others, other contemporaries who were watching at the time, that there's no doubt that Rand was influenced by some fairly malign people, one being Bill Waterhouse, and the other was Abe Saffron. It appears that Abe Saffron had pull with Neville Rand. You might say, well, how do we know that? Well, Abe Saffron had a crooked lawyer working for him called Morgan Ryan. Morgan Ryan was known throughout New South Wales, but particularly Sydney, particularly in that grey area between crime and politics and business and racing, in that area where people rub shoulders in Sydney. He was known as a fixer. He could get a result. He could organise blackmail. He could organise people to be bribed. He knew where the bodies were buried. And one good reason for that was he spent a fair bit of time working out how to bury them. And Morgan Ryan was on the payroll of Abe Saffron, alias Mr Sin, alias the King of the Cross, the man who had started out as a black marketeer in the 1940s and built himself up into a guy that ran brothels and sly grog shops and clubs and basically was a businessman whose business was sex and gambling 
and drink and drugs. So what makes Morgan Ryan a link with Neville Rand? Well, good question, and it's a fair question. But here it is. Morgan Ryan was very close to Lionel Murphy. Lionel Murphy, for those of us uh, who might be too young to remember, had been Attorney General in the Whitlam Labor government. Lionel Murphy was a brilliant lawyer, but a flawed man, many would say. And Lionel Murphy had his own sexual peccadilloes, and these were well known to his little mate, as he called him, his little mate Morgan Ryan. Morgan Ryan was friendly with Lionel Murphy. And one of the things that Morgan Ryan would do for Lionel Murphy through his connection with the King of Vice in Sydney, Abe Saffron, was to supply Lionel Murphy with underage Filipino girls, which was a very distressing thing and a very bad thing. But what it meant was that Morgan Ryan had his friend Lionel Murphy exactly where he wanted him. He had the dirt on him. And that meant his boss, Abe Saffron, had the dirt on him. And Lionel Murphy was very close to Neville Rand. And so here we have a link, link by link, where we have on one side only one degree of separation, Abe Saffron, manipulative, evil man, the Mayalansky of Sydney. He's like the Cray brothers in Sydney, but more cunning and ultimately more successful. And he was able to bribe, extort and blackmail his way around the place and his influence via Lionel Murphy could reach out to Neville Rand. Interestingly, as we mentioned earlier, Neville Rand's first wife, Marsha, had been a showgirl. She danced in the clubs and the theatre and she probably was uh, someone who would have known that whole milieu of dancers and performers who worked in Abe Saffron's clubs because it's a reasonably small world and she was part of it. And here's an interesting thing. Neville Rand left Marsha. They were married young. They were now around 20. And he left her shortly before he took up with his second wife, Jill Hickson. Jill Hickson worked for Qantas. She was a very good-looking young woman, popular in some circles, very popular in other circles. And when Rand took up with her, he dropped off Marsha, his ever-loving wife, the former showgirl. And a friend of David Waterhouse's, with whom I have had a long conversation, a man who is a millionaire businessman, a very quiet, nice fellow, a respectable businessman. He did have a business, a photographic business in the King's Cross area back in this era, and he knew a lot of the main players by sight or reputation, or he knew them personally. And he said he knew Marsha ran quite well, and he went around to her house, the house that Neville had presumably just left not long before, in the mid-70s at the time that he became Premier. And he went to see Marsha, and during his visit, he needed to make a phone call. And Marsha produced what was then quite a novelty. It was a home telephone that didn't have a cord. It was one of the early examples of the cordless telephone. You could walk around the house with this wonderful telephone not in the cradle and talk on it in any room and it would work or it was supposed to work. The reality with this one is that it wasn't very good at all and Marsha said, oh, this damn phone, it's like everything that Abe Saffron gives us, it doesn't work. The point of that story is not that the telephone doesn't work. The point of that is that Abe Saffron was sufficiently close to the Rand household at least leading up to this date in the mid-70s, that he would be giving them gifts, whether they worked or not. And that, I think, is a very interesting detail because it puts the lie to the thought that Neville Rand wouldn't have anything to do with the terrible Abe Saffron and wouldn't be seen dead with him and so on and so forth. No doubt Neville Rand would have realised as a politician that he should not be seen with Abe Saffron And indeed, he probably took steps not to be seen publicly with Abe Saffron. But whether he was that careful in private is another thing. We have to remember that these days we are surrounded by 
security cameras. We're surrounded by dash cams. We're surrounded by mobile telephones that have cameras in them. But in the 1970s, you could go around with relative anonymity and relative impunity because people weren't all taking photographs of you. You weren't being filmed as you walked into every room. You weren't being filmed as you drove down the highway. And so it would be that someone in Neville Rand's position would feel that behind closed doors he could probably visit whoever he liked. And the evidence would seem to be that one of the people that he visited or who visited him in private was Abe Saffron and Bill Waterhouse and Lionel Murphy and Morgan Ryan. And we'll be back after this to finish our story. So why would we be bothered marshalling all this evidence and uh, anecdotage together in order to essentially smear the memory of a dead man, to defame the dead, as they say. Well, in this country, with our defamation laws, these are the sort of things that can't be written and can't be spoken in public while people are alive, because our defamation laws in this country are so one-sided that the truth cannot be told. It can't be told in the way it can be told in most other countries, particularly in the United States, for instance, because there... Freedom of speech actually means something. But here, essentially, people like us uh, in the media have to bite our tongues legally because we cannot produce publicly the sort of evidence that's out there, not unless it is so overwhelming and so watertight that you can run the risk of publishing it. But of course, there is always a risk. And while there's a risk, No one wants to publish it, particularly these days. And that is why we are coming out after people die, because really, as we said before, all we owe the dead is the truth. And the efforts of some people, former Rand staffers, for instance, some journalists, some of them working for our own organisation, the rickety, lame, Arguments made for Neville Wren simply don't pass the sniff test. They don't pass the pub test. Neville Wren was called nifty for a reason. Neville Wren was called never wrong for a reason. Neville Wren had other nicknames as well, and he got them because there was a double-edged attitude towards him because some people, smart people, sharp people, Savvy people, people like him, in other words, realised that he was a pretty slippery customer, that he worked both sides of the fence, both sides of the room, and that it is clear that someone who starts out as a poor boy and becomes a battling lawyer and then a middling to good barrister, that then goes into politics and is Premier for 10 years and retires at 60 years old and actually becomes reasonably demented in his 70s. He lasted to a great age. He lasted until he was 87. But he was showing signs of dementia many years before his death. And it is said by those who knew him that he deteriorated fairly rapidly. Are we to believe that this man, after he left Parliament, essentially at retiring age, made so much money between the age of 60 and 70, that he accumulated a property portfolio and other assets worth $40 million. How did he do it? One thing is clear. He didn't accumulate $40 million worth of property by being a penny-pinching servant to his constituents. I rest my case. Thanks for listening. Please comment or rate it on whatever platform you're using. And if you haven't done it already, please subscribe.